Hi, I'm Elizabeth and welcome to Harkin and Heed. Today, we are going to be discussing Elder Anderson's talk entitled Fruit from October 2019, which of course you would maybe gather by the display I have right here. This is the display I used in my class earlier today. And if you've been there, you could have eaten some, but I guess you could just go find your own. Sorry, can't pass it through to you. Anyway, this talk was fantastic and it was perfect to time with Come Follow Me and our study of the iron rod and the tree of life and the fruit and everything else. And so today, it happens to be January and, and that's what we study today in our stake class. So let's dive into this talk. A couple of different things you could do with this. There's a lot of possibilities. You may feel like it's redundant because of everything that's been discussed about the Tree of Life and the Lehi's vision and Nephi's vision and everything else. But there's still really a lot that you can pull from this talk. And as we had our class today, we did a full hour and we could have gone for three more hours, I think, with everything. So hopefully I can help you as you prepare to teach, if you're teaching this one or if you're just studying, help you think of some ways that you can go a little deeper and apply this more fully in your life or for the lives of those that you're teaching. So he starts, of course, by using just a fun little play on words. Of course, he says his topic is an appealing one. It's fruit, right? And then he mentions a bunch of different fruits. And most of them I would say I know, but honestly, there's some I didn't, I did not know what a kiwano is. I've actually never had that, so I guess I'm going to have to look that up. Anyway, um, then he gets into the meat of it, which is that the Savior compared good fruit to things of eternal worth. And then here are three statements that you can use in a lot of different ways to present this idea of fruit and really flesh it out and make it awesome. We actually spent a lot of time right here, probably 15, 20 minutes, just right here. So the first statement is, ye shall know them by their fruits. The second statement is, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit. And the third, he encouraged us to gather fruit unto life eternal. So if we go back to the first one, ye shall know them by their fruits. You could take this statement and actually make a list or have them make a list and write out on the board how do we know that someone is a disciple of Christ? What fruits are evidence of that, right? And so you can have them participate by sharing, writing them down. You would always, it's a good idea if you're making a list on the board that you have a few ideas to start out with that helps them get the ball rolling. Or if, if they don't respond quickly, you know, you can start and then, then they'll get answering some. So you can make a list of the fruits that we see in those that are disciples of Christ. Right? They're faithful. They may be serving other people. They are grateful. Right? So, as you can see, you could go a long way with this. I don't want to list everything, and I don't know that I could. So, you could take this, and if you feel so inclined, if you feel the Spirit prompting you, you could spend a lot of time on this. Um, this might be particularly helpful as we get to a later section about the deceptions and distractions. How do we know the difference between the two kinds of fruits, right? How do we know where to go, what choices to make, how to spend our time, people to spend time with? All of that could be identified by the kinds of fruit that we see in them. So we'll hopefully get to that in a little bit. But you could spend a fair amount of time there. Ideally, the point is not necessarily to say, oh, here they are, but to take that and say, who do we want to become? What of these qualities, what of these characteristics or habits do we want to include in our life so we can be better disciples of Christ and so we can better demonstrate these fruits and help in missionary work or help our families or others around us, right? So there should be a purpose in making that list, not just, oh yeah, here's what you look, here's the fruits, right? Apply it to the life of those that are listening to your life. What can you do to have more of these particular fruits? All right. Um, every tree bringeth forth good fruit that ties in to this first statement. So you cannot have good fruit if you have a corrupt tree. And we see this a lot around us, right? We see it in movies and everything that people are presenting themselves as one way and yet they are actually the villain. Uh, I know Frozen 2 just came out and reminds me of 
Hans, right, in the first one, and here he was presenting himself as this wonderful, you know, immediate love interest of Anna, who they become engaged, and here he presents himself as this, but the fruits he demonstrates are over here, and he's actually corrupt. So they have to match, right? Um, and then the third statement is, he encouraged us to gather fruit unto life eternal. This one is the one I chose to spend more time on and I felt more prompted to spend more time on. So you may not feel prompted to spend time on this one. You might feel prompted to spend time on another and that's totally fine. The most important thing is that you teach by the Spirit. So for me, as I was preparing, I prepared all of them. And then as I reviewed in preparation to go teach, this is the one that stuck out to me. And then as I taught, this is the one that came to mind again. So this is where I focused. And I actually have a story to go along with this concept, this idea of gathering fruit. So my question that I asked the class was, what is involved in gathering fruit? And they started in, well, first you, you have to grow the fruit, right? You have to prepare the ground, you have to plant the seeds or, or plant the vine, you have to nourish it, you have to care for it, you even have to protect it sometimes from the weather or from animals or, you know, things that might destroy the fruit. And then, when it's time to go gather the fruit, there are other things that need to be done. And I shared a story that I'll share with you here. Uh, I have a wonderful stepmother and she has a beautiful, big, raspberry patch on the east shores of Bear Lake up in Idaho. And if you're from this region, you know that Bear Lake raspberries are just the best, right? Uh, my mom used to go gather Bear Lake raspberries when I was a small child and we looked forward to that day because we knew she was bringing home some awesome goodness with her. And I had not had an opportunity, I didn't even know where she was getting them. Um, she passed away when I was a teenager and so I didn't know where to go. But um, my dad remarried and my stepmom has this beautiful raspberry patch. And about five, five or so years ago, she invited me to come pick berries there. And so we prepared, and I'm gonna look at my notes because I don't wanna miss anything. And it's totally fine to look at your notes, by the way, when you're teaching. Um, so she invited me to come and some of my older children to come. So we accepted the invitation and then we made preparations. She helped us know what we needed and she has this great system where you cut the milk jugs and you cut an opening in the front and keep the handle intact and then she puts them around her waist on a belt and that way you can pick a whole bunch of berries and fill your buckets and your jugs and then not have to go back and forth up and down the rows a bunch because that breaks the vines and damages the fruit. So. We have prepared those. We knew we had to bring our containers and our boxes and everything we needed for gathering and storing the berries. She also told us what to wear so that we would be protected from the thorns and from the sun and from the mud. And anyway, we made all these preparations. And then we got up early, very early, the day we were going to pick and drove the two and a half hours to go get the raspberries. And we were told which which rows to go down and how to do it so that we wouldn't damage anything and also how to tell which raspberries were ready to be picked and which ones needed to stay on the vine. So we picked and we've done this for a couple of years and we pick for hours and hours and of course we eat a few as we go because they're pretty yummy. Um, when we're done, it's kind of a, a process and, and sometimes I'll be honest, my kids get a little worn out and. Sometimes I do too. Actually, I love picking raspberries, but when we pick, I'm kind of tall, and you know, you look at the leaves and see some berries, but in order to really find the best harvest and to really get all the berries as you're walking down each row, it's not enough to just stand and look for what's easy and what's right in front of your face. You have to get underneath. You have to look and pick underneath, and before you know it, and you can't see me here, but we're down and down and down and, and then we're on the ground and we're kneeling on the ground looking underneath to harvest all the fruit and honestly it's really when you get down there that everything opens up and you see all these beautiful red berries that you just can't see if you take the easy road and look from the top. So 
We finish picking the berries and we carefully box them up and bring them home and then we process them, right? We make jam, we freeze them, we do all kinds of yummy dishes to eat with, with the berries and we share them with our neighbors and with our family. So with that story, I shared that and then we talked about that process and how it applies to us gathering the gospel fruit in our lives, the fruits unto eternal life. And Elder Nelson tells us that, the, and we know this already, but he clarifies, want to make sure it points it out, that you point it out. What does this tree with the most precious fruit symbolize? And he says it represents the love of God. It procla proclaims our Heavenly Father's marvelous plan of redemption. And it symbolizes the wondrous blessings of the Savior's atonement. So the fruit represents three things, the love of God, the plan of redemption, and the Savior's atonement. Right, so though that's what we're trying to gather, that's what we're trying to bring into our lives, into the lives of those we love, so that we can enjoy those wonderful blessings and eternal life. And as he goes on to say, which includes, of course, living with our family members for eternity. So this precious fruit, which is most desirable, how do we gather it? What is the process? And so we took, we took that story of the raspberries, the Bear Lake raspberries, and then applied it to gospel gathering. And you know that we had to have an invitation and Christ invites us over and over and over again. And our prophet invites us, right? We already have it right here. We're being invited to gather the fruit. Then we have a choice whether we will accept and act on the invitation or not. Then we have to prepare, right? So we need to dress appropriately. We need to have the right equipment. We need to understand what's needed. And guess what? We're told all of that. We're taught it all. We have the information that we need to be able to prepare. And then we go, right? We go to the temple. We go to church. We go to the conference talks. We go to the scriptures. We seek. So we travel. We go to where the fruit is. And then we seek the fruit. We follow the instructions. There are instructions at the raspberry patch, just like we have instructions in the gospel, right? We have our commandments. We have our for the strength of youth. We have our temple recommend questions. We have a lot of things that give us instructions of how to live so that we can gather the fruit. And we seek it. We seek it by prayerfully studying. We seek it by going to the temple. We seek it by ministering and serving. We seek it by getting down and searching and looking and getting on our knees in prayer and being humble, right? There's so many different ways we can seek. So that might be something you could explore, right? In your lesson or in your own study, how are you doing? How are you seeking the fruit? What kind of effort are you putting forth? Because I know when I am up there picking the raspberries, I don't want to miss one, not one. As I go down each row, I want to make sure I'm getting every ripe one that is there because they are beautiful and so delicious and, you know, I'm hungry by the time we get there. So I don't want to miss any. And we don't want to miss the blessings of the gospel, the gifts that Heavenly Father have to give us. So what are you doing to seek and gather those fruits unto yourself, right? And once we have them gathered, what do we do with them? It's not a one-time event. Even though maybe picking raspberries might be one time a year, right? We preserve them. We share them. So we share with those we love. We share these fruits just like Lehi wanted to do, right? He, he beckoned to his family to come and partake of the fruit. And that's what we need to do. We need to share it and be ministers and missionaries. And then we also preserve it so that we can savor it for longer in, in the jams and in the jellies and in the frozen you know, berries and other things. We do the work of continuing to nourish ourselves and keep that fruit so that we can continue to partake of it by preserving it, right? So we do that by the daily things that we do, our scripture study, our prayers, 
um, on the service and everything else that we do. So as you can see, there's a lot of different ways. I only just mentioned a few that you could apply to a story. You might have a different story about gathering fruit. You might have a different story about recognizing fruit, but you can see that it's useful, right? It, it ties it in, it makes it personal, it helps us see what we can do and how we can apply these steps in our life. You know what? There's another problem about picking berries, um, and that is it's not always fun in games, right? There are some, some things that happen that aren't that fun, like mosquitoes and mud. I really don't like mud. There's thorns and there's other bugs, right? There's weather, it can be rainy or really hot. We run into adversity sometimes when we're picking berries. There's opposition, There's, it's not all fun and games. And Elder Nielsen, oh sorry, I said Elder Nielsen, I mean Neil A. Anderson, uh, talks about that as well. He talks about how once we have partaken of the fruit, and to partake of the fruit means that we, I'll read his words here, we embrace the ordinances and covenants of the restored gospel. Being baptized, receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, and entering the house of the Lord to be endowed with power from on high. Through the grace of Jesus Christ and by honoring our covenants, we receive the immeasurable, immeasurable promises that are given to us through this fruit that's being offered. Before we go to the challenges, I want you to go and just think for a minute. Close your eyes. It works better if you close your eyes. I know some of you won't because, well, there's always a few rebels, right, that won't close their eyes. But close your eyes for a minute. Think back, if you can, to a time when you have had a bite of a so, just so super delicious fruit. Maybe you have a favorite fruit. I, I have a favorite fruit, but I actually like a lot of other fruits too. So think of your favorite fruit, if that helps. What does it look like? What does it feel like if you have it in your hand or um, you're holding it or peeling it, right? What does it feel like? What does it smell like? When I had this tray sitting in the room, some of the sisters that came to the class walked in and they said, oh, it smells so good. You know what, I had not even noticed the smell. But they did when they walked in, right? What does your favorite fruit smell like? Now imagine that you're taking that fruit and place it in your mouth and you bite down on it and all the juices squirt out and it fills your mouth, the flavor just fills your mouth. What does that taste like? How does it feel? However wonderful it feels, what the Lord has to offer is even better. So I have two stories of fruit. You can open your eyes now. <laughs> um, when I was 14, I got to go on a pioneer trek with my stake, and this was back um, when they were operated through Brigham Young University, which means that they were actually a little more rugged than what, at least I know my kids participate in now. My kids did it four years ago, and they brought in the chef. They had you know, people that were in charge of the meals. They had three full meals a day and, and plenty of water and everything else. But when I went on trek, we started at one in the afternoon, and we pulled the carts until one in the morning. And we did have some water, but that was it. And we found out later that we had done this super hard women's pull up this really rocky um, stretch up a hill and we were so tired and so exhausted. Um, at 14 years old, I was the strongest girl in my family for the trek. We had one blind girl who was wonderful and she was at the back, but I found myself at 14 being the one during women's ball that had to, had to grab the wheels and really force them up and over each rock. And um, it was, it was a wonderful experience, but I'll tell you, by 1 a.m. I was so tired and so hungry that when they handed me one orange and a roll, I was so excited and I tasted that roll and that roll tasted so good. But then I tasted the orange 
and that orange was amazing. I, like my whole world of oranges changed when I ate that orange. And I don't know, it was the middle of summer, so probably it wasn't a wonderful orange, because I know now that summertime oranges actually don't taste that good around here. But boy, I thought that was the most wonderful thing I'd ever eaten. And I remembered it. Then, about 25 years ago, I had the opportunity of traveling to Thailand with the ballroom dance company from BYU. And we had been through uh, Taiwan and Hong Kong and China, and it had been wonderful. But after three weeks of eating Chinese food, authentic Chinese food, we were kind of anxious for some, some things we were more familiar with. And we got to Thailand and they had all this wonderful fruit. And oh, we thought we were in heaven. And the second day we were there, they brought us something that looked like this. Now, I don't know if you can see that very well, but it's a fruit that is not here in the United States. And they told us it was called a mangosteen. Now, that's what I still call it, and I think that's what it's called, but my guess is in Thailand they have a different name for it, of course, and probably some other names. But this fruit, we started eating it, and all of us just went crazy. We had, you know, about 50 of us, and wow, mangosteen, amazing. They taught us how to pinch around the edges and open it up, and inside was this white fruit, which, I look at this and I think, well, that's what it looks like, but I wish I could taste it. It's been over 25 years and I still remember how wonderful this fruit tasted. It was so great that actually the next day our hosts saw that we loved this fruit. So they bought us like 20 pounds of mangosteen and we had eaten all of it in about a three hour time period, if I remember correctly. All I know is that mangosteen went really fast and we all were just in love with mangosteen. We tried to bring a little bit back to the United States, but of course that didn't work. And so we knew that was the end of our wonderful mangosteen experience. And now when I think of Thailand, the only thing I think about is mangosteen. And there's other great things that I hope someday I get to go back. But I know that when I do go back, one of the first things I'll be doing is finding me some mangosteen because I thought it was so, so incredibly delicious. And even that, that wonderful fruit, that mangosteen, doesn't even come close in comparison to the fruit in the tree, on the tree, in the vision of Nephi and Lehi. This fruit that we learn is most sweet above all Lehi or Nephi had ever tasted. And it filled my soul with exceedingly great joy. This fruit was more desirable than any other fruit fruit. Now, I could say this is sweeter than anything I'd ever had, and I did enjoy eating it, but it certainly didn't fill my soul with joy. Not like the fruit of the gospel. Not like the power of the atonement of our Savior. Not like the knowledge of the plan of salvation. All these things are far more desirable. So when we choose to follow the iron rod, to come to the tree, to fall down at the feet of our Savior, not just because of our love and our gratitude for Him and in worshiping Him, but also because the journey is hard. That going on the straight and narrow path and holding onto the iron rod is hard. We are all faced with challenges. We're all faced with adversities. We will all go through the refiner's fire. And because of that, when I read that that they fell down before partaking of the fruit, I thought, you know, yeah, probably because they're exhausted. <laughs> probably because they're so grateful that they've made it. Probably in gratitude and humility for what our Savior offers us and for how he carries us when it's so hard on our own and we feel like we can't do it. Elder Anderson says, as we have all learned, even after savoring the precious fruit of the restored gospel, staying true and faithful to the Lord Jesus Christ is still not easily done. And then he mentions that, as we heard in other talks from this conference, we continue to face distractions and deceptions, confusion and commotion, enticements and temptations that attempt to pull our hearts away from the Savior. 
Because of this, Lehi's dream includes a warning. And he talks about the great and spacious building and how people of all ages are pointing fingers, right? Mocking and scoffing at the righteous followers of Jesus Christ. So it's important we bring this up and ask, I would ask, have you ever felt that way? Have you ever experienced being mocked or pointed out or ridiculed for your beliefs? My guess is that everyone has at some point, and if not, they will. I have, and sometimes it's been by people that share or should share my belief system, my, my belief in the Savior Jesus Christ. And sometimes those are the hardest ones to handle. When you think they believe what you do, and yet they mock you, that's hard. And I know in my home, I have a situation where my husband has left the church and, and sometimes I get it and my family, we get it right here in our own home. And so when Elder Anderson says, the adversary's construction crews are working overtime, hastily inflating the large and spacious building, at, at building. The expansion has spread across the river, hoping to envelop our homes, while the pointers and the scoffers wail day and night on their internet megaphones. So if this is happening in your life and it's happening in the lives of those you love. So what do we do, right? How do we handle these verbal attacks of doubt and disdain that he talks about, right? Um, some of which come from those that feel ashamed of the gospel. The false allures of the world seduce them. They turn away from the tree and from the fruit and they fall away into forbidden paths and are lost, which is heartbreaking to me. Right? It's happening now. It's happening all around us. It's happening on social media. Right? It's happening on our phones. It's happening in our homes. It's happening in our news. It's um, happening with organizations and groups. and It's all over the place. You could spend a lot of time talking about how it's happening. Um, that I would be careful of unless you feel very prompted to do so. Because you can spend a lot of time there and it, it's really negative. But at the same time, there might be a need to identify how it's happening so that people can be aware of what they're watching for, what they need to be watching for. And I know in our area there are certain things happening in the schools that maybe we need to discuss and help families be aware of so they can protect their children or teach their children truth, right? Um, so there may be an incident or something that's going on locally that you might need to bring up. But be careful of getting political there or uh, bringing in too much uh, discouragement, honestly too much of the down, right? We know what's happening and most people are aware of how it's happening in their life. So you can just bring that up. And then we can go to the quote from President Nelson. He says, the adversary is quadrupling his efforts to disrupt testimonies and impede the work of the Lord. Let us remember Lehi's words. We heeded them not. Those four powerful words that we see that Nephi actually lived in his life. He gave us an example. Christ gave us the example. How can we not heed those that point their fingers at us? So this might be another place that you could talk about. What does it look like to not heed? How do we strengthen ourselves or, or um, make sure we're living our covenants to, to not heed? How do we fortify our emotional health so that we are not heeding those that are accusing or trying to make us feel ashamed? So there are some areas you can go there that we heed them not is so important. Then Elder Anderson continues, although we need not fear, and fear is a key word here. There are a lot of people that fear. I know when we were first going to pick the raspberries the night before we went, I didn't sleep at all because I was totally afraid of rattlesnakes. Um, and it turns out that we didn't have to worry about it. We didn't see any, and we haven't ever seen any. But uh, you could, you know, mention there are a lot of things that we can be afraid of, but there's no need to fear, right? When we trust in Christ, we rely on Christ, we gather the fruit, we do our work. Um, he says, although we need not fear, we are to be on guard. Don't let the little things upend our spiritual balance. So that's another area. What might some little things be? Okay. 
And then he says, please don't allow your questions, the insults of others, faithless friends or family members, or unfortunate mistakes and disappointments to turn you away from the sweet, pure, and soul-satisfying blessings that come from the precious fruit of the tree. And we, you could spend a little time on that. We all know, I, I know people that has, have had this happen. I know that I've had times when I've had questions or I definitely have faithless friends and family, um, but I choose not to heed them, right? I choose to continue to put my trust in Christ. He says, keep your eyes and your hearts centered on the Savior, Jesus Christ and the eternal joy that comes only through him. So if you think about eyes, eyes in order for us to see, we have to be able to focus. And so we focus on the Savior. And our hearts, that's our desires, right? So our desires are pointed toward the Savior, to becoming his true disciples. So our eyes and our hearts, and then we feel that joy, we can experience that joy. So you may ask a question like, what would, keeping our eyes and our hearts centered on the Savior look like in your life? What would it look like in my life? What might you do differently today or tomorrow if this was your focus, right? So those are, those are questions or ways you can apply it to yourself and to those that you're teaching. Um, and then he shares an example of somebody who did this. He, talks, he tells us the story of Jason Hall. And um, Jason Hall was actually at BYU when I was there. And I remember seeing him and I believe he served as the BYU student president, student body president. And I remember thinking how amazing he was and what great things he was doing and just what a great example he was. Um, so you could share some of the story. Again, you probably wouldn't want to read it, the whole thing, but there are parts you might feel prompted to pull out. Um, he talks about how Jason was was paralyzed from a diving accident and Jason prayed that he would just, please just let me have the use of my hands. And that prayer was not answered in the, the way that he'd hoped. He did not get the use of his hands. And, and others may have said or could have said, oh, well then God doesn't care and he's not listening and you shouldn't believe anymore. But Jason chose not to heed those those that would say those things. He chose instead to continue to believe and he went on to do wonderful things. And he married a wonderful woman and they had, they waited 16 years and then they, well, I shouldn't say waited, they, it was 16 years before they were able to have a child. And, and that's a trial that many people are familiar with, right? So they experienced a lot of trial, but his wife said, we knew that God provided us a savior whose atoning sacrifice enables us to keep looking forward when we want to give up. I know I've had times in my life when I have wanted to give up. And it's only through the atonement and the power, the atoning power of the Savior that I was able to even get up off my floor and keep going. Maybe you've had times like that. And I'm sure there are those that you might be teaching or sharing this with that have had times like that. We can rely on our Savior. We can trust in Him. And then their son, as, uh, Jason, after Jason's death and at his funeral, um, the son talked about how he knew that he would see his dad and his dad would have a perfect body again and how important these fruits, this plan of redemption and the power of the Savior are for them. And then President Nelson says, he, well actually Elder Anderson quotes President Nelson, this is a quote we hear quite a bit, he says, the joy we feel has little to do with the circumstances of our lives and everything to do with the focus of our lives. So if we think of our eyes again of focusing, focusing on Christ, and our hearts focusing on Christ. He says, when the focus of our lives is on God's plan of salvation, which again is the fruit, right? And Jesus Christ, also the fruit, and his gospel, we can feel joy regardless of what is happening or not happening in our lives. Joy comes from and because of him. He is the source of all joy. So that there is really the crux of this talk along with the quote that is at the front about keeping our eyes and our hearts centered on the Savior, right? If, um, and then Elder Anderson gives us these promises. The Savior's arms are always outstretched to you. His fruit is plentiful and always in season and is available to all who honestly desire it. 
So what a tremendous blessing. You never have to go hungry if you truly, honestly desire and are willing to put forth the effort to gather the fruit, right? He says, pray and believe. If you feel like you're not experiencing the joy of the fruit, pray and believe. And then he gives another promise. I promise you that as you look to the Savior in every thought, the fruit of the tree will be yours once again, delicious to your taste, joyous to your soul, the greatest of all the gifts of God. And he continues with, the Savior said, said, He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So not only do we have the fruit that we partake of in the gospel, but we ourselves, and this goes back to those first three statements at the beginning of the talk, we ourselves then have produced fruit, right? We then have the fruit within us that we can share and we can experience through the Savior, through His grace, through His light, through the Holy Ghost, through the gift and promise of the atonement of Jesus Christ. So we then produce that fruit as well and, and it shows in our lives and others can see it and we can share and minister and spread the gospel. And then he quotes President Nelson again. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, you are living exemplars of the fruits that come from following the teachings of Jesus Christ. We are, you are, we are not perfect, but as we strive and as we seek and as we gather, we feel the joy, we partake of the fruit, we receive the blessings, and it shows, and we share it with others around us. There's so much that is in this talk. I've only just covered some of, some of the key concepts that jumped out at me and that I felt impressed to share. I hope that as you study, that you will be prayerful and that you might feel the joy and the fruit that comes from seeking the, what is found here within these talks and that the Spirit can teach you. And if you have the opportunity to teach others that you might do the same in a prayerful way and follow the Spirit and allow the Holy Ghost to work through you to teach those that are in your congregation or in your family or those you have opportunity to share this with. I know and believe and have a tasted of the fruit and it is joyous and it is powerful.